Um, thanks a lot for having me, for inviting me. I hope you had a good lunch, also some coffee. Yes. Um, my name is Leon Davi. I'm a freelance open source investigator. I'm currently a senior investigator with the Myanmar Witness Project of the Center for Information Resilience. I'm also the lead analyst for the EUAMS project of Lighthouse Reports. Uh, I collaborate with some different organization of different kinds on many different uh, projects, but um, as Sylvain said during the introduction, the uh, identification, analysis, and tracking of weapons and weapon system is sort of my little niche. Um, I, I had to pick one of the stories to, to share with you today, and uh, I picked this one. It's one of my favorites, and it's also, thanks. Was also a pretty complex case. So yeah, I hope you like it. This was an investigation that I co-led uh, as a co-lead investigator and I uh, came out with the BBC a while ago. And um, the, the main event that prompted this investigation was uh, an incident that occurred on January 4, 2020 in Libya. Some, um, some very young people that you'll see in this video in a second were marching in the evening. Uh, it was like a drill. These are cadets from the military academy in Tripoli. And the location was bombed by an object that uh, not only initially nobody knew what it was, but not even where it came from. Um, this is why we thought this case was very interesting. It was particularly grave within a context that naturally has seen a lot of violence. But uh, these kids were super young. Uh, they're all civilians because despite being enrolled in a military academy, their legal status is, doesn't change. Um, and um, I think most of them were teenager. 26 is the number of, total number of casualties. And uh, nobody to this day has ever claimed responsibility for this attack. The event was captured on CCTV, and um, uh, about 50 people were there. Um, the object strikes in the middle of the group, um, and the, what, what we're trying to do is to answer to three basic questions, which was what hits the grounds of the academy, and uh, how did it get there? and who was behind this attack. So the, the military academy in Tripoli lays in the southern part of the city, and uh, that is, uh, at the time, was in uh, GNA-controlled territory. The GNA uh, is the UN-recognized government of Libya, and at the time, um, Naturally, it was in a conflict with, uh, with the Libyan National Army, but in that specific time, in January 2020, uh, the, the LNA had launched an attack, and uh, the city of Tripoli was, was under siege. The LNA is usually very quick in claiming, uh, in taking credit for the military triumphs, but in that case, uh, the opposite happened. The day after, on January 5th, the spokesperson for the LNA not only denied they had any responsibility, but in fact, they said that that location is in a list of green zones that they will never attack, which is peculiar. And um, they claim that the attack must have come from GNA Hale territory, even possibly what he alleged from within the academy itself. Um, I think at the time they were alleging this could have been a, a mortar round that hit um, the cadets. Naturally, no evidence was presented for any of these uh, claims. 
So what we did is um, within the realm of open source investigations focus on arms is the identification of, uh, of the items. In this, ish, in this case was particularly challenging because we only had fragments uh, of some type of piece of ordinance which at the time we didn't know what it was. Um, so we've managed to obtain a video of uh, the moment where these fragments were laid out. Uh, this was also January 5th, so a day after the attack. And uh, the idea was to present, that's what they did in this video, they presented the evidence, I think, to for GNA uh, prosecutor for eventually prosecute this, this killing. Um, well, at, at this, in this phase, even though you have very limited and damaged and burned out pieces of metals, uh, the idea is to focus on some of them uh, and on their peculiar features to try and identify what kind of system or weapon they belong to. Um, in this case, we were kind of lucky because some of these pieces survive at the point where we could recognize them. So in particular here, we recognize the fins and uh, a bolt mechanism and a connection system. Um, thanks to these three elements, we were able to identify the object that struck the ground of the academy as a Blue Arrow 7. The Blue Arrow 7 is a Chinese manufacturer, uh, Chinese manufacturer um, high explosive air to surface missile. And uh, in the next step of the investigation, what we have concluded is that uh, it was, it could have been fired only by one aircraft platform, which is the uh, Wing Lung 2 drone. Um, one of the reasons that had um, led us to this conclusion is that the Wing Lung 2 was identified already by the UN panel of experts, which is tasked with monitoring the compliance with the UN brokered arms embargo on Libya since 2011. Um, they had identified the uh, BA-7, the Blue Arrow 7 missile, as being <coughs> ballistically paired with the Wing Lung 2. Now, this is a very strict scope. Naturally, this is a missile that can be um, mounted on many other types of aircrafts, but within the Libyan context, this was the only aircraft platform which was capable of carrying and firing this type of ordinance. We called um, this investigation Game of Drones because as we knew that already, but as we investigated, we found that probably wasn't the most um, active battleground for drones, but it certainly it's in the top 10. Uh, we found that both sides, which um, are heavily backed by foreign partners, they use extensively many different type of drones. So some would be smaller, some would be bigger, some would be used for observation and maybe directly artillery fire. And then they both operate large drones that are used for attacks. Um, I realize we are much more familiar today with, uh, with the example of Ukraine with this sort of platforms, but uh, right before the invasion of Ukraine, this was a bit of a lesser known, kind of a new um, topic in a way. Uh, even though there, was a, there is a huge proliferation of all these many models of different types within both entities, the Wing Lung 2 still represents uh, the most advanced military platform when it comes to drones. And that is specifically because of its range. Um, it has a 1,500 kilometer range, a very significant payload capacity. Uh, so in trying to 
responding to the, the questions I, I laid out for you at the beginning, we try to understand physically where this platform had come from. So what we did is we uh, mapped, we identified and we mapped all the air bases that are present on Libyan territory, which are a lot, um, and we uh, cross reference that the map that resulted out of that analysis with the range of the Wingloom 2. Um, we went very in depth on each of them and we found that only two in the period of interest in January 2020 or right before that were operating Wingloom 2 drones. One is Al Jufra and one was Al Khadam. Um, when we went more in depth with Al Jufra, we saw that while he had been operating or we registered the presence of Wingloon 2 drones up until August 2019, by September 2019, we don't find any more trace. Um, we know that also in August 2019, the airbase sustained some significant attack that have damaged some of the hangars uh, and some of the aircraft on the tarmac. So after that, we sort of focused on Al Khadam, which uh, was a more interesting and complex uh, story. Because Al Khadam is a huge base and has been there for a while. Actually, it's not that huge. Al Jufra is bigger. But the thing that made it interesting is that we saw that between 2014 and 2017, the base had witnessed a heavy upgrade. Um, we, we then proceeded to identify heavy aircraft and other type of armament that we found uh, that was stationed at Al Khadam through satellite imagery to try and conclude which actor was behind the upgrade and eventually the use of the airbase. So this may look like uh, Winglung 2. This is actually its predecessor, is the Winglung 1. Um, less capable platform, naturally. We also saw Black Hawk helicopters, which are kind of weird to find in uh, Libya. A2, A2, and um, and Hawk air defense systems. Now, we, within the actors that were involved at the time in the war in Libya, we found there was only one that operated all these systems um, in its arsenal. And uh, that's the United Arab Emirates. Um, not only uh, by reviewing uh, open source data on uh, the transfer of armaments, we had found that uh, the UAE had a few years back acquired a significant number of Winglung 2 drones and a significant batch of Blue Arrow 7 missiles to be used specifically with the, with the Winglung 2. Um, this was a very interesting discovery, the UAE has um, nominally supported the, the UN effort in Libya, but has always been very cozy with, uh, with the LNA. Um, in fact, the UN had already, uh, again, the UN panel of experts, had already verified in 2019, so way before the attack, that uh, the UAE had delivered Winglum 2 drones and BA-7 missiles to the LNA. And hence, they were actually in violation of the arms embargo already. Um, the attack is in January 2020, and at the same time, there is this very important event in Berlin. It's a UN-brokered conference in which all the states that are involved uh, in the Libyan issue come together. Also, so does the UAE with its uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, um, in reiterating the support uh, to the UN efforts and also in, in promising that they wouldn't interfere in any way. 
So, yeah, this was, uh, this was very interesting. At the same time, uh, when this was happening on a diplomatic and public level, we just found out that the UAE behind, uh, behind the curtains uh, was, was operating in favor of one of the two actors, and it wasn't even the, the UN-backed one. Um, in, in, in going a bit deeper, um, w not only we were able to uh, ascertain the responsibility of the UAE because if you remember we have identified the rockets, uh, the missile and then we've identified where it came from and with that the country that operated the base. But as we started to look more into this, uh, we found that right after the attack, um, the UAE had vacated its Wing Lung 2 drones from that base in Libya and they had virtually disappeared, uh, which um, brought into cause another player, regional player, that we found had a much more significant um, involvement in the war that we initially thought. I'm gonna leave you with that note of suspense there. So also getting back to what, what it means to do open source investigation with, uh, with arms uh, transfers, you really end up becoming familiar with items uh, that were not really part of your, of your niche before. Even if you had no prior knowledge, uh, because so much research was done on the protagonist of this story, which was this drone, um, we really went deep into try to understand how it works. And, um, and yeah, so in this case, um, we found this video is from 2020, 2012. This was the first time uh, it was showcased at, the, at an arms fair in China. And we saw how the whole how the whole system works so uh, you've seen in the video the control rooms and um, the the other box with the radar dish that's a, a satellite uh, link center and then we moved on satellite imagery focusing on that same airport for that on the day of the event so we could get a view how does that all setup look from the sky um, here we have the uh, satellite uh, link center, uh, and the other one is the control room. Um, they have some very peculiar shapes, so we went back to Al Khadam, and that we found uh, the same two boxes, um, among others, which we believe were like electrical generators, maybe one is a canteen or a bathroom, doesn't really matter. What, what, what matters is that we could identify these two boxes and understand that from those, the Wing Lung 2 was being operated. Something else that we noticed that had disappeared from Al Qadam uh, following the attack are these boxes, which we initially believed were just random containers that you can find in, you know, uh, air bases or, or next to warehouses, just nothing important about it. Um, but the fact that they also disappear between Jan right after January uh, 2020 and before February 2020, it sort of made us more interested. So we went more in depth. And by going a bit crazy on uh, the Chinese side of military content on the internet, which is uh, quite a rabbit hole and kind of hard to access. Um, we found this um, promotional video from the manufacturer of the Wing Lung uh, that shows how the drone is flat packed and disassembled when it has to be moved. And we realized that those boxes had the same shape and dimension. They, they didn't exactly look like container boxes, they're longer and thinner. So we understood those must have been the packaging uh, where the wing loom was initially brought in when Al-Qadam and so possibly also uh, moved out. 
Um, we saw that 11 boxes had disappeared uh, in January 2020. And so we were looking for where these boxes ended up. Um, Egypt has also a very high number of air bases and we went through a lot of them until we found one in the middle of the desert close to an oasis called Siwa where we find starting from February the exact same number of boxes with the same shape and the exact same number and setting of the command centers for the Winglu 2 drone. Um, we, we analyzed more satellite imagery and we understood that starting from February 2022, uh, sorry, 2020, the, the Egyptian uh, base was actually hosting Winglung 2 drones. Um, there were rumors already of a pretty significant involvement by Egypt, um, but this one was the most um, damaging and controversial. Uh, we went deeper in trying to verify some of those other um, claims as well, and we focused on this other air base, uh, Sidi El Barrani, that's in the north uh, west of Egypt and only 80 kilometers from the Libyan border. Uh, we basically focused on two very interesting uh, items. First of all, the the base was hosting uh, Mirage 2000 fighter jets. These are also operated by Egypt, but uh, the way we saw them in, uh, in, uh, in satellite imagery, it was clear they were painted with this livery, which is very peculiar. It's not used by Egyptian Air Force on any of its aircrafts, and it's identical to the livery used on the Mirage 2000 of the Emirati Air Force. Um, this jet was involved already, I think was the summer of 2019. You may remember uh, the, the UN had claimed that these fighter jets had been used in an attack against a migrant center in Tripoli, which killed around 50 or 53 civilians at the time. The other uh, information that we thought was very interesting coming out of Sidi Barani was um, the presence of tactical military transport planes. Uh, this is the Aleutian 76, but we also found other models. These were consistently spotted at the base. Um, when we tried to track the provenance of these aircraft, we found that in multiple cases they were coming out of the UAE and then they would turn off their transponders mid-air. When I say mid-air, I mean cruising altitudes and cruising speeds. So it's not that they were about to land anywhere, um, but they would just um, disappear from radar. Uh, right after that, we would find the same type of plane in uh, on the tarmac at Sidi El Barani. Um, if that wasn't enough, um, in a few cases we did the other way around, uh, the same the same little trick. So we saw the same planes that had disappeared from radar the day before leaving from Sidi El Barani the day after with the destination uh, being the UAE. So what we basically had uh, discovered is that we had never ascertained the nature of the cargo that was being transported, uh, but we saw this was very frequent and very consistent. Uh, so basically this told us there was a presence of an air bridge uh, from the UAE to this base at the Libyan border. Egypt was uh, also playing this sort of double game, apparently. They were very supportive uh, of the UN efforts, but 
you see what happened in reality. Six months after the attack, they actually inaugurated another section of the base, a city Barani, closer to the coasts. And uh, he made this kind of unusual, uh, where well, there is a lot of muscle flexing with the military hardware, but he actually, he actually asked the troops to be ready not only to defend Egypt from within the border, but also from outside with, from potential threats. Um, none of the two governments that we had contacted uh, have gave us any reply for the questions that we as the BBC posed them. And it was just, um, it was pretty sad to see this um, discarded. Some of them were interviewed, uh, very, very young, and some of them must have enrolled after the fall of Gaddafi. And um, they, they, again, nobody had ever claimed responsibility yet, but we know they have been killed by this Chinese drone operated by a foreign country uh, that is now stationed in yet another, um, a third country being, uh, being Egypt. That's, uh, that's a story I wanted to share with you. If you have any questions about this one or, or, or other issues or other stories pertaining um, open source analysis, please. First, I, I guess we can applause Leone. Thank you very much, Leone. Uh, so the question I'd like to ask is about uh, the maybe some software that you have used, some means of automation, maybe machine learning, uh, to find uh, uh, the containers with the drones or something else on uh, uh, this um, uh, satellite imagery, because it's, in my opinion, very tedious to make uh, uh, manually. So did you do it like how? Manually. Uh, which is great news, so none of us will be jobless anytime soon. Um, I don't think there is a machine that can uh, go through that kind of very peculiar and small content um, on its own. So yeah, it is very tedious, but it's also fun. So first of all, thanks for your presentation. I would like to ask you, uh, can you like do OSINT uh, just for aircraft weapons or uh, for all other type of weapons? Me personally? Yes, yes. Your um, it would depend on the case. Um, but literally, it's not even just about weapons. Uh, that has been one of the most uh, recurring and useful uh, application in this world, depends who, who your clients are, I guess. Um, but uh, I also do trainings, and one thing I always say is just about focusing on the details. I had to do some stories about stuff that has nothing to do with, with weapons, uh, but it's just about f focusing on the little details, and that will help you uh, distinguish, analyze, and eventually identify. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar, the uh, Lighthouse Reports, for example, does a lot of work with um, illegal pushback in the GNC. And uh, one of the story I did, it was just a very short video of some guys pushing migrant off a boat. And these guys were in a inflatable rubber boats that just like there could be a thousand different models. Um, but by you know going crazy and making your eyes bleed for two weeks, uh, you can identify with another colleague, we managed to identify some details that told us that was only a model employed by the, U by the Greek Coast Guards. Uh, they had three and we identified it was actually one of them coming from a larger, uh, surveillance boat. So, yeah, I, I think it's th the application is virtually unlimited. Yeah. Uh, I think that you might have answered my question with the eye bleeding just now, but still I'm going to ask it anyway. So I was wondering if you can walk us through a little bit 
through the process of identifying what weapon has been used. So I know that you're a weapons expert, but if I am not a weapons e expert, how would I go about trying to figure out um, what weapon was it? Like, can you recommend a database, or uh, do I start in Google? Where do I start? Uh, I'm not a weapons expert either, but we can become, uh, we can become experts, rubber boats or, or Chinese missiles. Uh, I would say it would depend on the context you are looking at. Sometimes a, start, a good starting point is Wikipedia, uh, which you know, I wouldn't trust 100%. Very often is inaccurate or incomplete in the lists. Um, but still, um, it's, uh, it's very often when, when you would start, especially if you are talking about an armed group or an armed force that is new to you and you know nothing about, perhaps you want to use that or official, um, official channel. So for example, right now with the war in Ukraine, I'm very surprised that a lot of uh, websites from the National Ministry of Defenses, they report what their armed force are equipped with and in detail what has been delivered to, as aid to Ukraine. Um, this is, I mean, coming from Italy, that is my, that is my country, which has, uh, has all the support they've been given is completely secret and we have no idea, there is no list. So you, you'll have to find your way around it. Um, but, but yeah, one other point I always try to stress is creativity. So there are a lot of, uh, official sources that we can exploit, uh, but sometimes we need to you know, think outside of the box. So perhaps uh, stalk uh, the website of manufacturers, or there are other organizations that go on the grounds and actually document the remnants and the arms they find, like Conflict for uh, Center for uh, Armament Research, CAR, or uh, SAS, that's attached to the University of Geneva. Um, so yeah, uh, after that, what I do is that I create my private library. So I know exactly when I see something, uh, where I can go look. And in the case, I don't know, of Sudan, I already have you know a list of maybe five to 10 uh, sources I can consult. And eventually, if we keep doing this consistently, we build not only our library, but even our own knowledge. So it would be quicker for you to think about the right platform, uh, much quicker compared to the first time you did it a year prior, where you bled your eyes for, uh, for a week. Okay. Hello, um, it's working. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, just a bit, uh, small question about tolling. Um, what kind of uh, sources did you use to, to track uh, military aircraft for their departure and arrival? Um, that would be Flight Radar 24, maybe Radar Box as well. Um, they have if they have a, a limited amount of historical data you can access for free. Um, but, um, but if you wanna go beyond that to get actual full lists of these air tracking from a year before, you'll have to have a paid account. Um, also something that it's, it's really cool from the, from the OSINT nerd uh, network perspective is that you can always, if you are looking for something like this and you don't have the availability and the possibility to access those data, you can always ask online uh, as a private message or a public message. Uh, there are a lot of uh, cool OSIN practitioners that uh, don't mind at all having a look. I mean, that's been my experience. Hi. When you have uh, an area you'd like to get satellite pictures, um, how many companies can you look at to get those pictures? Is it 10 companies, 100, 1,000? Um, I think, so the, some of the satellite, satellite imagery were so specific and, and recent at the time that we had to pay for. Uh, we had to pay for them. That's still 
open source uh, material, if, you, if you're asking yourself. Um, I think that market is, has come a long way. So it's, we have more and better imagery there is, that is available. But there are certain portals, like I'm thinking, for example, Apollo Mapping. You ever heard about it? It's, uh, it's a portal where you can pick a specific area and time, and they will tell you which satellite imagery from which provider is available. Uh, so then perhaps you can contact them. There are different organizations, different companies. Some of them, they may cost less than others. Uh, maybe I'm adding something to the point that was made previously. Some of the companies like Planet Lab, for example, they, they grant you some imagery for free if it's used for human rights, to monitor human rights violation. So that's, that's a way also, I don't know if you work on your own or you are um, part of a group, but that's also an interesting agreement that makes it uh, easier for smaller organization to access uh, that sort of imagery. With some of the fancier one, like Maxar, for example, it gets a bit more complicated because you'll have to have a, a media agreement with them. So it's, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit harder to access. Um, there are several free um, providers. The quality is not always great, um, but it also depends what you're looking for. So if we wanted to uh, identify one of these drones with Sentinel Hub, for example, might be a bit more complicated, but to monitor the upgrade and expansion of the base at Al Khadam, it could have been definitely possible to, 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 to witness that change and to, to share it to the reader. With the reader. Uh, thanks for the talk and for your time. I just wanted to, to be sure of something at the beginning of the talk. You showed the, the financial transaction uh, for, the, the two, uh, for the drone and for the missile. You said that that information was open source. So you can actually today see um, weapons transaction around the world or it is a limited scope? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends. Uh, depends who are you looking at. Uh, notoriously with some countries, in this case, China, the UAE, that's not very uh, accessible information. That page was a screenshot from CIPRI. You ever heard about it? Is the Stockholm International Stockholm Institute for Peace, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute? So what they do is that they collate together uh, information on arms transfers using open source data, and they they build a registry where you can just type in the seller and the receiver, the year and the type, and you can get that. Usually, we go one step further and we want to verify that those claims. Uh, I think at the time that was something that came out of uh, official magazine from, um, there is a, a big uh, arms fair in the Emirates every year. I think it's called IDES or something like that. Uh, the, the, the official magazine of that event had reported that that contract was signed at that time in that context, something like that. Hi, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I was wondering, because we're talking about Libya, uh, there's a lot of Turkish imports going through the port of Misrata. Did you have any follow-ups from there? Do you have any Sockman tools, or did you just purely focus on satellite imagery and some, some videos for this? Or uh, wh wh what did, Why did you not focus also on, on the Turkish part of things? Uh, we, have to pick, we have to pick our stories. Uh, this relatively small event uh, it costs me and about 10 other people two months full time to research. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we, we picked this because it was particularly cruel and nobody had any idea who was responsible. Um, but then you, you are right, there is a lot going on uh, also from the GNA side. Uh, there are some stories. I've personally only contributed with this big story on Libya. Um, but if you want, there is, uh, there is plenty to look at, even with, uh, with Turkish support. I think also the BBC has done some really interesting 
OSINT-based short documentaries like this one on the Turkish provision of uh, armored personal carrier to, to the GNA. Um, there are stories with the Italian provision of uh, patrol boats to the Coast Guards, uh, Bayraktar TB2 drones, naturally. Uh, but yeah, I guess, you know, you'll have to pick your battle and, uh, and at the time see what your priority is and why a story would stand out for you. This was interesting because the, the UA thing was known, as you can see, the word documents that had um, certified their presence beforehand and their support for the LNA. But this one was a very controversial and, and hot way to to show the readers that yes they are there 100 percent they're actually very very active too Pre pretty interesting i'm adding something about libya and turkey uh, there is a nice report from open facto the the non-profit organization that is very useful and uh, you you can download it on the open facto website and also you can uh, see open facto booth they are they are very kind and, uh, and yeah we have another question just here Thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding how the war in Ukraine and all of the OSINT work that has been done through that has affected the way you conduct your own OSINT investigation. Has it made your work easier or the opposite? That's, uh, that's a good question. I think that um, with the war in Ukraine, there has been... Uh, you can see more open source uh, work that is being done. It's also found more its way into the mainstream media. It was already a trend, but this is certainly a significant push. Personally, I don't think that's necessarily a synonym with quality. Uh, and that coupled with the quantity uh, because naturally, if you do open source investigation into the desert of Libya or the jungles of Myanmar or northeastern Nigeria, there is a lot less content. And whatever you find is much harder to verify, geolocate, chronolocate. The quality is usually poorer because the phones that they use, they don't always have access to internet. So it's, uh, yeah, there are these trends playing out right now uh, but what I found myself doing I'm certainly more it's easier to find stuff but I would be much more cautious into approaching that kind of evidence so that's that's an approach I would have anyway like we said in the case whoops, of, of CIPRI because a source said this is happening is, is not enough we'll have to verify that ourselves uh, but in the case of thousands of different people claiming they are experts because they have a blue check next to their name and they can write so many more characters now, I think it calls for us to be more cautious and go a bit deeper when we do verifications. Also because a lot of parties that are interested, lots of different narratives, uh, which is also probably uh, a consequence of this being so plugged into the, the mainstream media right now, uh, so it certainly calls for more professionalism from our side and more consistency with our uh, verification work. Do, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So uh, I have a question that's maybe a little more off topic, but uh, what, you see, what you seem to be doing can have more heavy consequences for foreign nations and, and uh, well, my question is, uh, how do you handle your OPSEC and how do you consider OPSEC? Because I think the work you're doing could quite upset some powerful people, possibly. How do you experience that? How do you deal with that? Or, yeah, how, how do you go, uh, how do you handle your OPSEC and how do you view the, the threats others might pose for the work you do? Yeah. Um I certainly don't do enough. Um, I'm, I'm very cautious in my, in my private life and in my life online. Um, I think 
one effect of this story coming out, I think the uh, Egyptians' offices of the BBC were were asked to to be vacated. Um, I guess it also makes a big difference if you're doing this on your own or if you're doing this with an organization. Uh, working with the, with the BBC was really cool because, you know, they are very straightforward if we are sure about what we're saying. So I think that's the kind of support that uh, a practitioners uh, or professional like us would need, that sort of encouragement. Uh, I feel it might be more sensitive when it comes to like social media, for example, uh, how not to be tracked and uh, how to use VPNs, how to use sock puppets accounts. Uh, that may be more, even more sensitive. And um, from that perspective, I really don't do enough and I'm, I'm constantly scolded. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's very, very very important. Nothing happened to me so far, but. Okay. Just Hi. Here. Um, yes, I was interested because you mentioned you, you encountered some difficulties when you had to uh, find the, the Chinese uh, packaging of the drone, for example. Uh, which difficulties did you encounter and how did you by bypass uh, them? I'm sorry, you said the uh, difficulties with the uh, finding uh, information on the China oh. side uh, with the packaging of the drone, for example. Yeah. Um, you probably have experienced it yourself. Uh, researching on some countries, it's harder than others. Uh, there are some things that we can do to make it easier on ourselves. For example, which, uh, uh, which website you go to or what language you do your research in. Um, but I think the Chinese case is notoriously uh, a challenging one, just because they, they're pretty secretive about their military programs. And at the same time, there is quite some proliferation with non-state actors. Uh, so I think, I mean, it's not censorship, but it's just that high level of discreteness, which makes it harder for you to obtain information online for free. Um, so I, I've, I've done research since then on, on more like Chinese made uh, armament and stuff. It doesn't get easier. That's why, for example, maybe something we can, we can underline is the importance of archiving. So stuff that is, in, is being taken down now survives for us to consult uh, if it was archived a few months ago, a few years ago. But... Uh, I don't know, it just takes longer and um, it's a bit more stressful in that sense. Um, but I guess also that's something that comes with experience, like what kind of places you go to look or uh, what kind of, of keywords do you use. And eventually even what, what we mentioned before with creating your own, um, your own libraries, uh, the, the, the idea of saving and cataloging all the products that may be of interest of you. These are all state control entities, by the way. So it's, it's not a lot of many small companies. Uh, the idea of saving that for yourself in a place where you, go, you can go consult them whenever you need, that would certainly facilitate um, your process rather than starting from scratch online on Chinese uh, websites using Chinese words for drone Libya killing. Um, I guess if you become a bit more familiar with your niche, you, you will be quicker and more efficient in your research. So you know, oh, these are the four manufacturers of big aircraft platforms. So that's, that's already, you're saving yourself some time. That's already where you would go and look for that kind of uh, material. We, we have another question here. Yes. Um, so I was uh, wondering, in the light of some of the, the rumps that are going on tomorrow, since you're a weapons expert, did you see anything coming up with 3D printed weaponry? Because I know there was a lot of weaponry that was just dropped there by the Americans and it was taken by the Libyans, which is a thank you for creating ISIS. But um, did you see any influx of this in, in the conflict itself? 
Um, and second of all, the second question I had also is, Wagner was there at some point. Uh, did you see any experiences learned by the local army and how this was transferred? Because you also mentioned some Russian jet fighters. Is there any link you can make from like battle experience or some of the, the Wagner contracts for demining, etc.? Did you see any influence from the Russian presence back in the day in the country on how they were operating their operations right now? Uh, your first question was about American... Of what kind of weaponry? 3D printed. Um, well, first of all, I'm not a Libya expert, so I don't constantly monitor Libya. Um, I don't think I have any experience uh, within Libya of 3D printed weaponry. Uh, but don't quote me on that. I've never been an active monitor, and especially after this case. Um, I'm thinking about Myanmar actually much, much more. And uh, when it comes to Russian presence and how that may have influenced the military capacity of the LNA. Or the, at least the experience you got from their interaction with the Russians. I don't know. I mean, the, the, most of the Russian uh, supports, and again, I'm not a Libyan expert, came from Wagner. So not, the, not really the most professional and, uh, and literate uh, military minds you may find um, and also what I feel we must say is that the Libyan context is I think military service was compulsory and there has always been a lot of weapons and these guys have been fighting at least since 2011 so to have a bunch of convicts coming in and teaching you how to do it I don't I haven't seen any of that um, I think they came with their fair dose of newer platforms. For example, the use of, uh, of observation drones to correct mortar fire was uh, an established uh, pattern with uh, Wagner units in Libya, and that, that spilled over to, to Libyan units that were collaborating with them. But uh, I, I, I don't think there was anything more substantial uh, or, or serious. Yeah, hello, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, was I was wondering if you um, use sometimes a d uh, content that is on the dark web as a source? I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I Maybe something uh, relevant. Uh, what do you think? I'm sure there is a lot of, uh, of potential, especially if you're tracking. Uh, I, I follow a lot of people that follow the dark web. But uh, as I said to your colleagues, if my, my OPSEC is not good enough to do OSINT, I certainly don't want to go to the dark web. <laughs> um, but especially what I've been mostly interested in is uh, state transfers of weapons. Because I think, you know, people think there are like some like uh, arms smuggler always moving this stuff. But in a lot of cases, the big bucks and the destabilizing transfers are companies, big European companies. Uh, so if, yeah, I never had that, that kind of need. I'm sure it's, a, it's an enormous pull, but I guess it depends what your priorities and what your focus is, like uh, an illegal market or, um, or a, a retransfer of, of weapons. We are always talking about smaller numbers when we talk about the dark web anyway. But yeah, don't, not an expert. Do you have more questions, guys? Me, I have one question. What are the last investigations you've done and where we can read it or watch it? <laughs> uh, I've been working a lot on Myanmar right now. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, there are a lot of reports on the website of Myanmar Witness, uh, especially focusing, I mean, that's what I do with the, with the identification and transfer of weaponry. Uh, Myanmar, witness has, Myanmar as a context been very, very interesting to apply and test your knowledge, also a bit of a nightmare, because those are one of those countries that would be harder to do this sort of investigation in, because they've been isolated for so long that they started producing their own stuff, 
and it's very very crude and it's very secretive and there is no manufacturer website because it's a dictatorship since uh, 1956 basically so I, I spend a lot of time looking at pieces of metal that uh, I know have killed people uh, but I, 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 I rarely find an ultimate identification of a make or a model um, sometimes that's not even that important uh, with Myanmar Witness, we work a lot towards accountability. So we try to link, you know, the, the user, in most cases, the Myanmar Air Force, and that little piece of metal that allows me to say this is a S5 rocket or S8 rocket or cluster munition. Uh, talking about foreign provision, we, we've seen a lot of stuff from Russia. We've seen a lot of stuff from Serbia. Um, maybe some... Chinese components that are produced locally, it's very, very, very murky. But uh, yeah, that's why we work a lot. Do we have more questions? No? Nobody? Well, thank you very much, Leonie. It was a pleasure. Thanks.